So our, our final speaker for this uh, in, in this group is Professor Fred, uh, Fred Pryor. He's Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Professor of Radiology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Uh, his extensive R&D experience in industry and academia. He focused on the design of advanced medical information management and imaging technologies. Uh, he has had senior management positions in a variety of R&D environments, uh, ranging from Silicon Valley startups to major multinational corporations in the United States and Europe. Dr. Pryor's research interests include cancer informatics, radiomics, and neuro neuroimaging informatics. He is principal investigator and director of the US National Cancer Institute's Cancer in Imaging Archive, and is the lead PI of an NCI ITCR team exploring the integration of radiomics and pathomics. So we'll pass the floor over to Professor Pryor and uh, hear his talk. Thank you, Dr. Chalmers. And uh, uh, that was a kind introduction. And I want to thank the uh, organizers from Inter uh, Intersect and uh, NCI for inviting me to speak with you today and to enjoy the wonderful talks that we've all uh, just experienced. It's, um, on the one hand, a bit daunting to be um, the last speaker after such great talks, but on the other hand, it is a privilege to, to be here and be able to, to speak with you. Um, as has been mentioned by Dr. Chalmers and Dr. Kapathy Kramer, one of the things that keeps me busy and my research group is the, the care and feeding of the Cancer Imaging Archive, which provides cancer image data and other uh, information to a global research community. Um, so most of my research and my research group are funded by Dr. Couch's agency at the National Cancer Institute. But the work I wanna to talk to you about today actually um, is part of a project funded by uh, the European Union. And um, it's part of their Horizon 2020 program, which is, um, exploring a wide array of different aspects of improving our ability to use cancer imaging data through advanced machine learning and artificial intelligence. And one of the deliverables from my work package within that program is tools to create synthetic data. These are tools based on generative uh, machine learning models, most specifically generative adversarial networks. Now, the title of my talk is a bit misleading. I realized after I um, put it together uh, in that I said cancer data, but really I'm a cancer imaging researcher, um, quite similar to Dr. Kalpathy Kramer. And most importantly, I focus on radiology imaging data. We do work with uh, other data types, including pathology. So really this is going to be generative adversarial models for synthetic cancer imaging data. All right, so if I'm working on a big program to explore the use of machine learning in cancer imaging, why am I synthesizing data? Why, what, what's, what's the rationale here, the, the reason that we're interested in this problem? And the answer is labeled data. So um, previous speakers have talked about the problem of generalization of deep learning models. And there's a rule of thumb that I teach my students that came from Ian Goodfellow from um, Google. You're gonna hear quite a bit about uh, Ian and his work in this talk. But his argument is if you want to build a deep learning model that's equivalent in performance to a human, you would, you would need about 5,000 labeled data samples per category. So if it's a classification problem, a binary classification, two categories, 10,000 samples. But to really generalize, and we've heard many speakers talk about the generalization problem, you would need 10 million. Now, if you're Google, that's not a problem, but for the rest of us, that's a real problem. Because predominantly we're using supervised learning techniques which need labeled data, and we just don't have enough. Even repositories like the Cancer Imaging Archive do not contain, for the most part, enough data to really uh, allow generalization and enough variability in that data. Because remember, to generalize, we have to represent the um, variance in the population that we're studying. In this case, the variance in 
uh, human genomics and in disease uh, genomics and disease presentation in humans. There are 8 billion humans. That's a lot of variability. So label data is a real problem. And in particular, because in our case, in imaging, it's produced manually by human experts who have to, say, segment or some way identify uh, uh, lesions or make determinations that define the truth for um, both the training and test sets in a supervised learning environment. This is very expensive. And of course, there's not a whole lot of data. So one potential solution for this is data augmentation, expanding the, the labeled data set using synthetic data. And that's not the only form of data augmentation, but it's the one that we're going to talk about because it's what uh, uh, stimulated our interest in generating synthetic cancer imaging data. So what's synthetic data? Well, you, you, you sort of guess from the, from the title that it's data that's artificially created, not generated by from actual events. So it's an artificially created CT scan, not one that was created by actually passing X-rays through a human body and, and uh, reconstructing an image. Now, usually this is done by machine learning algorithms, which is what I'm going to talk to you about. But there are other ways of doing it. Um, some years ago, when I was at Washington University, my colleagues David Girada and uh, David Polite and I did a study where we built a mathematical model of lung nodules uh, for uh, cancer imaging and generated um, a large collection of lung nodules that had uh, well-known characteristics, which allowed us to test a variety of different scenarios. And then we inserted these into real lung CT images that did not have cancer, did not have lung nodules of their own. So we created synthetic data by sort of manually inserting these modeled lesions into real data. That's just one example of uh, other ways of producing synthetic data, and it's uh, rather time-consuming in and of itself. So if I'm creating a synthetic image, the standard for medical images, particularly radiology images, is of course the DICOM standard, digital image and communication in medicine. Uh, all major equipment vendors use this standard to represent images. And in general, an image contains pixel data, the, the image itself, the picture, and metadata about that patient and about how that image was created that's stored in a DICOM header. So if I'm gonna create synthetic data, one or both of these may be artificially generated. So this is an example of what I mean. This is a uh, synthetic header that was created as part of a project that we were doing with in our European Union program. We've actually created um, many thousands of cases now for the National Cancer Institute, where we uh, identify using the DICOM standard uh, which has a has it in it a standard for how to de-identify data. So it allows us to identify those fields or do, those data elements in an image header that contain protected health information or patient identifying information and need to either be removed or modified in some way. So all the data that you see here, patient names, et cetera, it's all made up. It's all synthetic data. Interestingly, we used to make um, totally invented um, patient addresses, and we were working with Google, and they actually checked to see if it's a real address, if that ex address exists. So we actually had to make sure that our synthetic addresses were actually someplace real on the planet. Otherwise, Google would be upset with us. Um, so we, we generate these synthetic headers, and we can also generate the synthetic images. And so this is a, a synthetic mammogram that was generated actually by our colleague, uh, Iman Banerjee at, at Amory University. Who we were working with at the time that and we were doing this particular part of the project. And you can see that we can generate not only the image itself with certain characteristics, but also we can embed in it um, what we call burned in pixels or burned in patient and identifying information that would have to be removed by any uh, software that's trying to de-identify this data, because obviously this patient name can't be allowed to remain in the image. And so, in fact, what we were doing in generating this, uh, these data sets was testing 
different suites of tools that do image anonymization or de-identification, anonymization in Europe, de-identification in the US, according to the DICOM standard, and being able to evaluate those, um, but without having any data that would in any way identify a human being. Okay, so that's that's one of the reasons for actually generating synthetic data, and there, there are many others, but I, I wanted you to realize that in fact, it contains these two components because it's important for the two to match. If I have a mammogram that was generated with a certain MA and KV, um, that, that will be reflected in the header. And so if I create a synthetic mammogram, I have to make sure that its characteristics match whatever acquisition parameters I put in that header, which turns out to be a rather challenging problem. All right, so why, would I, why do I want synthetic data? Well, I've already had introduced two reasons. One is training data for machine learning algorithms where we can expand the labeled data set by taking by generating synthetic data where we have inserted known lesions of particular types. I can also expand the data set with specific characteristics that are of limited supply in the real data. So for example, we're, we've been working a lot on screening mammography and uh, that tends to be uh, data that's collected in, in older women. And so the, the breast density, radiographic density, tends to be in the lower end of the scale and the higher density are uh, less well represented in the set, in the data set. So it's an imbalanced data set and we're using synthetic data to make that balance. And I, I'll come back to that later in the talk because that may in fact be a problem in and of itself, but that's one of the reasons for, for doing this. Um, I've also, I've al already mentioned that we can generate synthetic images that uh, remove patient privacy concerns. Now we can use this, as I've said, for testing the identification software. Um, it's also been argued that under GDPR, the European Union's um, uh, privacy laws, that this might be the only form of data that is truly shareable, uh, although we've been contesting that, uh, that belief. I, I believe that uh, data sharing globally is really important if we're ever going to build large enough data sets to actually represent the variance in the human population. We also use synthetic data to build training databases. So for example, we have a, in our institution, uh, an EPIC uh, electronic health record system. We have a, a, an instance of that that's an exact copy of our real production uh, clinical system, but it contains only synthetic data that we've invented using uh, the, actually the tools that uh, we use to create the synthetic data for the DICOM headers. And so that now this can be freely used by our students. We can use it for research projects and not worry about patient privacy issues. And of course, we use synthetic data a lot as testing data because it can be freely shared. So we're trying to test algorithms. We want data with known characteristics. Uh, to look at edge cases, for example. So we can generate synthetic data for both uh, the text kind, but in our case, in the imaging kind, that allows us to test our algorithms, uh, not just machine learning algorithms, but other types of algorithms using uh, data that can be freely shared without worrying about violating patient privacy. Okay, so synthetic data, um, to a large extent is built using some kind of machine learning model that can create data. Well, that kind of machine learning model is called a generative model. And generative models um, basically represent data distributions. So this is a, a figure that I borrowed from OpenAI. Um, you see this interesting little shape here, that's meant to represent a distribution of true image data. So each of the data points would be an image and they, they are represented by a, data, a distribution of some shape. The green distribution, uh, P of X prime, uh, a hat, sorry, is generated. It's uh, generated in this, in general mechanism, where we start with some source, uh, can be a source of noise or it can be samples from a, from a Gaussian distribution. 
We run that through a generative model, which is a neural network of some structure that has a set of hyperparameters, which is called theta. And that generates a fake image, a, um, a made up image. And the goal of this process is to compare the loss, the difference between this distribution and this distribution. And we wanna minimize that loss so that the fake images are roughly indistinguishable from the true images. That's the goal of, of a generative model. And I've, I'm saying images, but in, in this case, it's very general, uh, generalizable. It can be any type of data that uh, you can use generative models to create uh, uh, text or uh, any other type of, of information. Because what you're doing is simply uh, looking, sampling a true data distribution and using this model to produce a, another distribution which is close enough. Okay, so how do I measure close enough? That's an interesting problem in itself because the loss function or measure of distance between the two um, is now a function of distributions and not um, simpler types of, of loss. And so there are specific types of loss functions that are used to compare distributions. I've just mentioned two here. Probably the most common one is the kullback liebler divergence, which is simply a way of measuring how different this P of X and Q of X distributions are. And so this, this would be, in this case, the, the, the measure of that distance or that difference between those two distributions. And that's the loss function. You're trying to then, in, in these algorithms that I'm going to describe, minimize this loss function. Now, there's another class of distances that, that also compare distributions, and they're called the earth mover distances or the Wasserstein distance, in this case, the Wasserstein one. Um, they're, they're called earth mover because you can visualize this as, as the problem of, I got a pile of sand, like here's a pile of sand, and I wanna move pile, that pile of sand to someplace else. So I'm gonna create another pile of sand and I, you know, the two piles of sand, I wanna minimize the effort to do that. Uh, so essentially, I'm trying to minimize some aspect of the distance or difference between the two. The Wasserstein metric, although it looks complicated, actually has some really nice features. Um, when we train a deep learning, or in fact, most any um, uh, machine learning algorithm, we use a process called backpropagation, which looks at the error, the, the uh, loss function, and it distributes that uh, loss or that error to all the weights throughout the network. For a deep network, um, this can be a problem because in order to calculate the contribution at each layer of that network or to each set of weights, you have to compute the gradient or the, the, the uh, derivative. In, in general, these are uh, high dimensional, so it's the gradient. Um, uh, the n-dimensional uh, set of partial derivatives. So you have to compute the gradient of the loss function. Well, in a deep network, that gradient can vanish and go to zero. Therefore, there are no contributions calculated past that point. It can also explode, which uh, is an even worse problem. The Wasserstein uh, distance has this nice property that rather than having this vanishing gradient, which is the red line, it has in general a linear gradient. And so um, it minimizes the problem of, the, of vanishing gradients in deep, algorithm, uh, deep learning models. So that improves the stability of the model and you know, uh, helps to ensure convergence. So it's, it's uh, growing in acceptance uh, as a way of, particularly for the type of models that I'm talking about, these generative models of um, calculating the loss function. There are many other ways. I just wanted to highlight these two because they they focus on this problem of uh, looking at the dis the distance or difference between two distributions. Okay, so generative models in general, um, there are a lot of them. This is a figure from a paper by Ian Goodfellow from 2016, and so it's therefore quite out of date, um, but it. At the time, it provided a nice taxonomy or hierarchy to describe the characteristics of generative models. Um, primarily, uh, we're 
we're using maximum likelihood estimation techniques and the, the distribution of the density can be explicitly defined or implicitly learned. Um, one of the techniques that is quite common now and widely used as a, as a form of autoencoder, a variational autoencoder. We're gonna talk about autoencoder, autoencoders a bit later because they become important for some models that are not on this diagram. But um, as the title suggests, we're going to talk about this model most specifically, the generative adversarial uh, network. So this is a type of machine learning network that was in fact invented by Ian and his team at Google at, in 2014. And it is an extremely useful way to invent new data. Uh, the network has two components a generator and a discriminator. The, the trick here, and the reason that's called an adversarial network is these two are working together, are working against one another rather, they're playing a game in the sense of game theory. And the idea is this network, the generator network is trying to trick the discriminator network into believing that its fake images are real. So what happens is you train the discriminator using real images, and the generator network is, uh, has an interesting trick in that it has the ability to create images from uh, some n-dimensional or d-dimensional noise vector. Uh, previously, I showed you sampling from a, from a Gaussian distribution. It's the same idea here. I'm starting with um, some representation and I'm gonna generate an image. Now, obviously when, you, when I start out, they're not gonna be very good images, but the trick is that you train this thing by having the discriminator predict the label, real or fake. Kept, uh, you then calculate the loss function and you, dis and you distribute that loss to both components, to the generator and to the discriminator. So at each step in the training, both of these networks learn their jobs better. And the hope is that the generator network gets a little bit better than the discriminator such that in the end, the prediction is no better than chance. That means you, you've, you've really succeeded and your images are, your fake images form a distribution that's really quite close, i.e. indistinguishable by, by this network uh, from the real images. And so that's sort of the, the key training trick in, in this. And it's the essence of this game that they're playing is that they're both learning how to play the game better, but you're hoping that the generator uh, gets just a slight edge in the, in the process. Okay, so what do these discriminator and generator networks look like? Well, we've already heard um, uh, in several, from several prior speakers, the idea of a convolutional neural network. The discriminator is usually a CNN, a convolutional neural network. And this is a, a deep learning network that basically extracts features at different, uh, a hierarchy of, if you will, or at different levels of granularity or resolution, a set features from images. And it does this by using a cascade of digital filters. So convolution means I'm creating, I'm taking a filter kernel, which is a matrix of numbers, and I'm convolving it. That's a process, uh, from signal processing, in this case, uh, image processing, that uh, is, a, is a way that I can apply that filter kernel to the image. And in so doing, I'm producing different versions of that image that are filtered in different ways. And what that's doing is extracting features from the image. But what features, Why? how is it guided? And the answer is at the end of this process, I produce a feature vector, which I, fill, I uh, feed to some form of classifier. In this case, I'm showing a, a uh, multi-layer perceptron that's fully connected and it's generating a predicted result. Okay, so we're trying to classify in, in our example, and again, real image, fake image. So it's a binary classifier. This thing then, uses backpropagation to train the entire network, not this part which makes the, the uh, classification, but it feeds back to each one of these filters and the weights that it's changing are the actual properties of the filter kernel. So it changes how it 
extracts features at each of these layers of resolution. And that's, that's the key feature of a convolutional neural network is it can learn the features that are important for making this discrimination, in our case, uh, real versus fake image. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the essence, although there are other ways of doing it, but in general, that's the type of discriminator that we use in a, in a, uh, a GAN or a, genera a, um, a generative adversarial network. The trick now is the part that actually makes up the image. And guess what? It's sort of the inverse of the, of the CNN. It starts with a what in this case is called a, a code. It's a paper by Radford and all, but it really, it's that um, noise vector. It could also be actually a, an image or um, uh, some source point, let, let us say. And the idea of this, in this particular model, this is called a uh, deep convolutional um, generator network from a deep convolutional GAN. But the idea is it's going to, uh, project and reshape this vector into an image of uh, basically the exact characteristics of the image of the real images that we're using in, in our GAN. And it does this using essentially the inverse of convolution, a deconvolution process that's, that is recreating the image. Now, um, there are a number of different types of network that can do this. Uh, I'm gonna talk about an autoencoder in a minute, which has the ability to deconstruct uh, an input, make a latent representation and then reconstruct it exactly as it was given. Um, if you're familiar with segmentation, we frequently use it, what's called a UNet. A UNet has a, essentially a CNN on one side and the inverse or a, a generator network on the other side. So there are a number of different types of um, generators that are available. This just happens to be one of them. And this is the key trick for generating an output from essentially in this case, a feature vector. So you've got some representation that you then can use to generate an image. Um, and we actually saw examples in Dr. Zhu's, uh, Zhu's uh, talk, his ID uh, TD model is a generator model uh, of similar type. So there are lots of these. In fact, there's a whole zoo full of GANs. If I can get the slide to project. Uh, again, this is a, uh, from a, originally from a paper by Ian Goodfellow, but the figure came from uh, art uh, artificial AI. Um, it was, they had a better version of the figure. Anyway, uh, the idea is that you can construct these in a number of different ways. So this is the one I've already uh, told you about. It's the, the uh, sort of plain vanilla original generative uh, adversarial network. I've already mentioned the deep convolutional network. In that case, both uh, the generator and discriminator are uh, convolutional neural networks, but one is the inverse of the other, as I've already shown you. There, you can have pre-trained versions of them. Uh, there are conditional GANs that allow you to, to modify the output um, based on certain conditions. Uh, the SYNGAN uses a single training image, but generates lots and lots of synthetic images. Uh, I'm gonna show you an example of that a little bit later. And then there's this interesting one, the bi-directional GAN, which uh, basically trains in two, two directions and it has two generators and two discriminators. And that network actually has another name. We call it a cycle GAN. And frequently when we're, when we're training these things, we use uh, paired images, right? So the generator is gonna generate a fake image and uh, that's gonna be paired with a real image. Uh, and as we're training the, the GAN. A cycle GAN doesn't have to do that. It just has a distribution of each kind of image. And because of the way it's structured, it's trained a whole lot faster and it can generate uh, very realistic image translations from one uh, representation to another. So in medical imaging, uh, we can generate an image with pathology from one without or vice versa. Um, 
And the way this works, it seems a little bit complicated. This is the, the simple picture. You notice it's got two discriminators and two generators. And so this, we sort of expand it to make it easier to see. So we start here with X, it got, it's the original um, source of noise, let's say. We put that through generator G and it, it's evaluated by discriminator D. But we then take the samples that it's produced and run them back through discriminator, uh, through, I'm sorry, through generator, I said discriminator, I meant generator F to produce X hat. So I've got the original X they started with and then another one that I've generated and I can look at the cycle consistency loss. And there's, what's the loss going through one cycle of this by comparing X and X hat. But it goes the other way too. Right, so I can start uh, go backwards from Y through F uh, to produce X hat, and then you know back to Y hat, and so I can do the cycle consistency loss on the other side as well. That's the trick for making it uh, train a lot faster because you're going through this cycle uh, and getting two loss functions, one in each direction. So it's going bo both directions. This is a very very useful type of, of GAN. In fact, the um, uh, image that I showed you of a mammogram was generated with a, with a cycle GAN. It, is, it has another interesting characteristic though. Um, this is an example from the paper by Zhu. You, you take a photograph of a field with poppies in it. And you, if you train the cycle GAN correctly, you can turn that photograph into a, re a rendering as if it was painted by Monet or Van Gogh or Cezanne or Ukiiko. This isn't a problem because nobody's going to buy a fake Monet. But if you're a contemporary digital artist, it's pretty easy for someone to gather up your work, train a GAN, and copy your style, and then mass produce images as if you had produced them. This has generated a massive number of lawsuits uh, in the courts as I speak, because it's, it's really destroying the uh, field of digital art because it's so easy to copy using tools like this. Now, we're not in the business of creating fake Monets or of, of stealing other people's um, livelihood for, uh, from their uh, creativity, but we are in the business of using this to create different types of images uh, the, to augment medical imaging data. And so that, that brings me back to data augmentation. Um, traditionally, data augmentation is not done with synthetic data. It's done by taking your real measured data and shifting it, rotating it, adding noise to it, and other, some other ways of deforming it so that it increases the size of the sample in other words, it increases the variability in the sample, but doesn't change the labels. Um, that is still done, it, but now what we're going to do is add to that capability the idea of generating synthetic data using this kind of model um, so that we can expand the original data set. But we can also change the characteristics of the data. So uh, in this paper by Lee et al., they started with a CT and their goal was to generate an MR. So this is a paired set because they needed truth uh, to train the algorithm. So this is the CT and this is the real MR. They used two different networks. One was a cycle GAN and the other was a UNET, which I've mentioned, but with um, an interesting combination of loss functions. In this case, the L1 plus L2 norm as its loss function. And then they calculated the difference between the synthetic image and the real one, and that's what's shown here. And so what they were doing was looking at how to minimize this loss by varying the model and model parameters in order to generate realistic, I'm sorry, that keeps moving, realistic um, MR images from CT, which is a very, very useful thing to be able to do. What's more interesting to us though, is synthetic data with variation. So this is a, a paper um, by Shin et al in 2018, where they started with data from the multimodal brain tumor image segmentation benchmark data set or the BRATS data set. This was part of a challenge 
Uh, this data is actually in the Cancer Imaging Archive. And they also took data from a, an ADNI data set. And they're both T1 MRs of the brain. They had a model which, a generative model, again, that uh, infers a, a brain atlas from the MR. So in both cases, they generated a brain atlas. But the BRATS data set also contained models, actually real, of uh, brain lesions. Uh, I think mostly GBMs, but the gliomas of some form. And so they had, they could extract those, um, mo the model, I'm sorry, the lesions uh, from the original data sets. And then they could modify the lesions. They could either Put, use them as they were, or they can shift them in location, enlarge them, shrink them, simple modifications to expand the amount of data that they get, and then merge those lesions because they've established this uh, consistent, essentially, brain atlas uh, model. They can then determine where to put the lesion based on what the knowledge that was in this real data set, they can then take this data, which had no lesions, but insert them. So they, they expanded their data set by, by um, modeling lesions from here and putting them into this data that didn't have it. But then they used a separate um, GAN to go from this label, if you will, to new MR images. So this was T1 to T1, but they also went to T1 with contrast, to T2, to flare. So they generated synthetic images from both of these data sets, starting with the original T1s. Now, not shown here in, the, in this study, but it's also possible to model the scanner. So you could go from a Siemens T1 to a GE T2 by having the model of the scanner. So you can introduce a lot of variability into the uh, synthetic data. You can change the, the you know, the um, contrast, the pulse uh, that would be produced by different pulse sequences, you can change the vendor, and you can insert lesions, but in a much more systematic way than the study that I mentioned that we did many years ago by manually inserting these, you can actually uh, uh, insert them appropriately, appropriately through mapping these, uh, brain, these atlases so that you have a consistent location. So it's a very nice study to show how you can take um, GANs and generate a wide variety of synthetic data with different variations that are would be important for, um, I don't remember what exactly the study they were doing, but for, in our case is for augmenting data. Okay, so I mentioned our EU project, it's called You Can Image. And uh, my work package, as I said, was responsible for creating synthetic data. Um, this was largely work by um, Richard Osuela at uh, the University of Barcelona and uh, on our end, um, Michael Rutherford and my group. Um, we created a library of um, pre-trained generative adversarial models, including the data that was used to train them, and uh, a set of tools that allow you to go to a uh, site that's actually, I, I, I should have put the site here, but um, it's actually referenced in the paper that, that, that's provided. You can go there, it's, uh, Menegan is running, and you can select a model and describe the data that you want to generate. And that model will generate a set of images for you and you can return them. It also has a user interface that if you're nice and have your own GAN that you like and data set that you like to contribute, we'd be happy to have it contributed. We'll evaluate it and then include it in the library. The library um, is fairly extensive and always growing. So this is actually, this slide is a bit out of date because we've uh, added to it since then. We were very interested, as you can see in mammography. So there are a lot of mammography models because uh, one of our first use cases that we've been working on is mammography. Uh, and so there are a variety of different GANs that are being, that are being used and uh, to solve different problems. We also have uh, some lung data and um, uh, cardiac MR and neuro MR. So not all of these are part of our particular um, UCAN image project, but we're gathering up models, as you can see, for, that for a wide variety of different uses. And as I said, it comes with the data so you can use this tool to generate data for yourself online. 
and download the resulting data. So we found that to be a very important contribution uh, for the community, but for us, it's a way that we're actually um, studying this problem of how do we generate real uh, synthetic data to augment the actual data that we're collecting from our five clinical sites and having our radiologists carefully annotate. Uh, so we're expanding the data set using these tools. There's another component of Medigan, which is data visualization and evaluation. This allows you to visualize the results online and actually change characteristics, uh, in some cases, of the input vector so you can change um, how the model, that model is working to produce uh, images that more to your liking. It also allows us to have a human expert assess the synthesized data for quality. Now that's one way of doing it. In fact, in general, we have two tier quality assessment for both um, the generated images as, as well as the um, actual images that we collect. And the first is a human assessment of acceptability. And the second is a metric, a quantitative metric the, of image quality. So in this case, the metric is, has to look at um, the distribution of synthetic data and the distribution of real data. And so we used a variation of the uh, Wasserstein metric uh, called the Wasserstein two or the Frechet um, inception distance, which is another uh, variation on this ability to um, calculate the difference between two uh, distributions, the FID turns out to be a really great way of um, looking at the quality of generated images because it's actually based on a pre-trained deep learning model called an inception model that extracts features from both the real and synthetic images and then fits these to a, di to a distribution, in this case, a multivariate Gaussian and computes the, the Wasserstein distance. So uh, it's a uh, pretty reliable tool for, for assessing the quality of the generated data. Okay, so this is um, where pretty much state of the art is in terms of generating synthetic data using GANs. But that's not the only, sorry, I keep uh, hitting my touchpad. That's not the only way to generate uh, synthetic image data. And I mentioned uh, when I showed you the GAN zoo that there were many other types of uh, models that weren't represented. And one of those is called a diffusion model. This, some people argue, is going to replace GANs entirely. And the idea of a diffusion model is you start with, in our case, an image and you destroy it. You successively add Gaussian noise in a diffusion process um, that turns the image into this latent representation, basically the noise image that you started that we would start with again. And then the inverse of, the, uh, of this diffusion process is the denoising process, which starts with this and returns um, the original image. That's how you train it. It's trained very much like uh, I've mentioned an autocoder, and I'll show you one in a minute, where the input and the output are the same thing. And you want the input to be as close to the output as, as possible because that's then you've got a latent representation that actually contains the information that will allow you to generate the output image assuming this process. And the process is basically a model's of Markov chain. So once you've trained this thing, then you can actually feed it these and generate new images. So this is the, uh, this is the generator side of this model. And as I said, it's very similar to a very old kind of model called an autoencoder. The, uh, this is a very simple version of an autoencoder. It's got one input layer, one hidden layer, and an output layer. And the key thing is the hidden layer is smaller than the input and the output. The input layer is the same size as the output layer, and the hidden layer is smaller. The idea of an autoencoder is it's uh, trained so that the input is, matches exactly the output. 
So in that sense, it's unsupervised because the input's its own label. So you just feed this thing, in our case, lots and lots of images, and it learns a latent representation. Now, these were originally done to, to form image compression, right? Because this is a compressed version of this that will, if you have this side of it, the decoder side will reproduce the original image. But that latent representation contains essentially the complete characterization of the input. So it is a complete feature vector that if you have the decoder can reproduce the input. So it's similar in concept to this, only this is much more complicated, but I'm showing you this for another reason. And that is um, this, text to image models. Now, everyone is familiar with ChatGPT, but probably less familiar with its cousin, Dolly. Dolly uses diffusion models uh, to create a new class of algorithms that generate images from text. So this is a, an example, a corgi, the text is a corgi playing a flame throwing trumpet. Boom, you get that cartoon. How do you do that? Well, first you have to analyze the text and to do that, you would use one of these. For example, you have a text encoder that's gonna take this text and turn it into a latent representation that exactly replicates it. And it's trained on a large bolus of labels for real images, right? So you find on the internet millions of images and they have labels that say, you know, this is a giraffe in Central Park. Okay, now I have text giraffe in Central Park and I have a picture to go with it. I'm gonna use uh, an enc another encoder. This can be, uh, I think they actually use one half of a unit, but um, they're going to encode each of the training images and produce a latent representation of it. The model in the middle, which they call the prior, maps the text encoding to the corresponding parts of the image encoding. And it does this using an algorithm that's embedded in it called CLIP. So the idea of CLIP is I take the latent representation from the text, which is a feature vector. I have the latent representation from the image encoder, which is another feature and vector. And what I'm going to do is maximize the similarity, the cosine similarity between the correct encodings and minimize the cosine similarity between incorrect encodings. So um, that's a, that's an interesting trick in of itself, but essentially what you're trying to do is, is relate specific parts of the text to specific parts of the image. That's in a nutshell what this is doing. And what you end up then when you feed it through this um, diffusion model, you've got a latent representation which comes from the, the um, uh, selecting the output that is the maximum uh, uh, maximized cosine similarity, right? So that's going to generate a, a uh, um, latent representation, which you then put through the diffusion model to get it into the right form for this image generator. And it then takes pieces of other images and generates this. So that's pretty cool. It's a great way to make cartoons and you can, uh, they actually made, um, Briefly, it was free. Now you have to pay to use it. Um, but it's a great way to, to synthesize lots and lots of graphics. The question is, can it synthesize medical images? And the answer is sort of. So if you ask it to generate an x-ray or a radiograph of the ankle, it does a pretty good job. It does a pretty good job in knees. Notice that this hand certainly grew an extra finger, right? So yeah, like ChatGPT, which is notorious for lying, um, Dolly makes things up. Uh, so, but it doesn't do too bad a job with radiographs because they're simpler. However, when you ask it to build MRIs of the heart, I particularly like this one where it sort of stuck it in the brain right? Um, it gets a bit lost in more complex imaging. So um, it's not ready for prime time yet as an image generator, but it's a very interesting idea. And you can imagine instead of uh, the kind of text that they might be feeding it, feeding it real 
characteristics of medical images that you're interested in. So there are a number of unanswered questions in regard to the use of synthetic data. Um, how much synthetic data expansion of our label data pool is really possible and still have a valid output? I mean, am I really representing the variance in the true population by inventing synthetic data? If I only have synthetic data in a given class, will that analysis even be valid? Um, I've mentioned how we evaluate the quality of images, but is, is that quality standard really good enough? I mean, how, how well do these things have to match to be of, of true use as uh, enhancements to our la uh, labeled data set? And does synthetic data remove, it when in training and testing for a model, does it remove bias or does it just introduce a different bias? So one of the ways of looking at this, and this is still an open question, so this, this is not definitive data by any means, but um, the idea is to um, use data effectiveness as a measure of image quality. And those was the output of my model that I trained with the synthetic data, was it useful? And the study that's referenced here in, the, in MIT News found that 70% of the time synthetic data was able to produce results that were useful on a par with real analysis. And of course, this is a this is, I'm not in any way related to this company, but uh, mostly AI suggested that their synthetic data, in this case, it was synthetic data used for uh, anonymization was 99%, uh, contained 99% of the information in the, in the true data. So it's an, another way of evaluating the effectiveness of synthetic data. This is by no means um, the final word, in fact, I'm not even sure I'm still buying this, but because I am concerned about the questions that I've raised, but um, there's at least work being done to try to evaluate the impact of synthetic data as, as training for real models. So in summary, um, deep learning models need a whole lot of well-annotated or labeled data to reliably reproduce um, the variance in target populations and to perform clinical tasks. That data is really hard to come by. Even the large public repositories like TCIA and, the, and its companions growing all over the world, uh, we still are very limited due to the cost of labeling it. Um, as I mentioned in our UCAN image project, we have a, a, um, data from five institutions and radiologists from those five institutions working night and day to annotate about 10,000 data sets. Um, that's a monumental task, but um, it's still not enough. We think that synthetic images can be effective to enlarge this training data set, but we have to use them wisely and we have to study the impact of their use on the usability of the model and its generalizability. We also want to use them to, to address class imbalance, uh, to fill in the gaps in our model. Again, perhaps in bi introducing bias, we hope not. And of course, we can use them to deal with privacy issues because the synthetic data can be freely shared. Um, one of the cool tricks, as I mentioned, is to generate data with uh, new lesions and of the, uh, particular characteristics, and also to generate data from that goes from one domain to another, like the CT to MR shift. So there's a lot of utility in the synthetic data generation. Um, and of course, as I've identified, there are some risks. So with this, I, I, I'm going to end a little bit early uh, because I think we have a panel discussion coming up and uh, I see that there are some questions. So I'll leave some time for questions and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thanks very much for your, for your really uh, intriguing talk there. And um, it's, not a, it's not a concept that I'd thought that, uh, that synthetic uh, radiography would be uh, so potentially useful. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in, in the chat. Oh, let me find where they are. So the first, uh, the first says, if we consider glioblastoma grade four glioma in brain cancer, which is heterogeneous and, a, and in different tumor tissue, 
In that case, uh, how can GAN modeling be used to generate synthetic data considering the heterogeneity and physics of the tumor growth? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, some years ago, we did a study to try to model um, using, using multimodal MR, um, the heterogeneity of, of GBMs. And basically we built a classifier to classify every voxel in, a, in uh, the brain as to whether or not it was cancer or not. And that, that approach clearly identified the GBM pretty precisely relative to other techniques and to what the radiologist thought and identified lots of other regions of the brain. So that's a real problem. The primary lesion, yeah, as long as we have some agreement of its boundary, which is a challenging problem in and of itself, as the example I showed you um, from the literature, you can synthesize that primary lesion, but the fact that it's invasive and um, we don't really know the true boundary and that other parts of the brain are already infected, no, that's, that's not necessarily in the model. At least I can't, I don't know of a way of ensuring that that's in the model. So that's a great question. Thanks. So uh, there's a there's a general question here about um, about sharing the slides from the talks. As as we've said, all the the talks will be online later, so you'll be able to go back and and uh, revisit the presentations if you if there's a particular bit you're interested in. Uh, there's another uh, question here from <clears throat> Archit Gupta. Thank you for the talk. I was wondering if Medigan can add controlled variations. Uh, no, number of clones, number of subclones, et cetera, based on user input. If not, is that something you believe is feasible for a tool like Medigan? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by clones and subclones. Um, it does have the ability, some of the models have the ability to introduce variations, um, but I'm not sure of those specific variations. Uh, we might we might ask if Archit can put his his or his hand up uh, and get more information on that question. Uh, there's uh, Jingbo Wang from the NCI. Um, it would be helpful to have some recommendations on how to generate synthetic data and avoid bias introduced. Any future work in this direction, uh, it can be uh, potentially leveraged to other imaging processing related domains. Yes, um, I, I totally agree. And that's one of, one of the key concerns is um, we're trying to address bias by um, rebalancing data sets, but we're not sure, I don't know that anybody's sure that we aren't introducing new biases that we're not really, that are not well understood. You know, the, the, model, the models are not perfectly replicating um, true images and that imperfection may be in a, itself a bias, or we may be, as I said, um, putting too much synthetic data in that doesn't represent the true variance in that subpopulation, and we just don't know it. So that produces bias. So we're trying to, we're trying to develop um, guidelines from our own experience by doing experiments of this type to, to put some boundaries around um, the use of synthetic data and data augmentation. Um, so I don't, I don't have definitive answers yet, but it's, it's again, another one of those great questions that uh, we're working on trying to understand how far you can go with this uh, before you are not addressing bias, but actually adding it. Thank you. And a uh, final question in the, in the Q and A um, says, uh, William Shiring says, I have a lot of cases but no controls for an analysis. Would using Medigan or another synthetic data set to generate my normal samples be a good idea or not? Yeah, that's, that's again, it's like the last question. Yeah, you can do it. Um, and it would be an interesting experiment, but I don't know whether it would give you uh, valid results or not. Um, the studies that I found suggest that it might, but you know, I can't swear to that because I think that's that is the important question around synthetic data. Now that we can generate massive amounts of it, um, is it really going to help, or does it um, in itself cause a problem? So we're trying to use it very judiciously 
and carefully and then study um, with and without synthetic data. So it'd be interesting for you to try that experiment um, and, and see. Um, what it's, but you also have another, you've raised another important issue that I'll put my other hat on in TCI. It's one of the problems that I keep complaining to the National Cancer Institute about. They only want to collect images of cancer. Well, that doesn't do us any good without the controls to go with it. We need an equal number of normals. And that's what we're not doing. So if you're in neuro, life is good because there are lots of repositories. Uh, for example, the repository from the um, Human Connectome Project that contain MRs of normal brains. So you can use those. But for most cases, we just don't have a big repository of normal lung CTs to compare for you know, lung cancer. So we really need to build those big repositories of normals for comparison. And we're all tempted to do what the questioner said was, well, let's just synthesize the normals. Um, and that may or may not be a good idea. <laughs> Th thanks very much. Um, so I th I th the plan now, I think, is to get all of the, um, the, the presenters online and, uh, and, uh, and open the floor for discussion. Uh, so let, let's see if we can get the others up as well. And I think if if people swap to gallery view, they'll get uh, they'll get all of the all of the presenters uh, so that you can see them. Um, so I, I I just thought I would pose the general question uh, about. Uh, artificial intelligence and, and cancer research. So what, what do you see as the panel as, as the real challenges and the real opportunities for applying artificial intelligence to cancer research that, that is not kind of, you know, that, that, that's emerging, that, that's newer and is not, not things that are, that are done and, and then the, the challenges that we face. So let's start with the opportunities. Well, maybe I'll jump in uh, because to me, one of the big opportunities, particularly from deep learning models is what is it actually looking at? And does that tell us anything new about cancer? And so doing studies where I'm trying to take the features of the, that I've learned and relate those to, um, well, in our case, path, uh, features in pathology images, but uh, underlying biochemical mechanisms to be able to, to link the imaging features that are that are learned to real underlying mechanisms because in many cases there are features that we already knew. So we did a study of lung cancer and when and when we analyzed what it was looking at, for the most part it was looking at lung nodules. Okay, great, we know that and that made us feel good. But in other cases it wasn't. Well, was that bad um, um, model or was that model trying to tell us something that we didn't know before? So to me that's a big opportunity because these things are looking at images with different eyes than we do and finding things which may be real and important or maybe not. So do we, so can we, can we learn, can, can we get the AI to tell us something that we didn't know essentially is, is, is rather than uh, things that we, we already have an understanding or, or knowledge of do. Yeah, and just yep. just that, you know, the odd bits that it points out sometimes that, um, you know, perhaps, you know, um, trained experts overlook, right, because it's something that you see all the time, and you sort of see it as an, you know, an anomaly that's always ignored or something like that, and the, um, the, uh, the algorithm doesn't know to overlook those things, right, so it focuses in on those things, and um, as um, Dr. Pryor just said, going back then and sort of thinking, you know, rethinking some of our underlying you know, hypotheses and thinking about what is that new um, information telling us that we can go back and really dig into the biology and, and figure out what's going on. I think that's a nice opportunity. And one that we're kind of seeing increasingly playing out this sort of back and forth combination approach. Do any of the other panelists have, have comments on that. So I, when, when I asked clinicians what they'd like AI to do for them, 
I get sort of two extremes of the spectrum. So things that they do, they can do, but it's boring or routine or mundane and do it well and fast and reliably and not get tired and sort of, so we can do a lot more quantification than we do today uh, because the techniques work relatively well. The other end of the spectrum is exactly that, which is things they cannot see. So can I teach them things that they have, that we have not learned yet, so. Yeah, I definitely get a sort of bimodal response to that question. Yeah, maybe if I could, and sorry to, to, to take two slots here, but no, no, no. what Ishri just said, I think um, one of the real things that we can do with AI is to create, is, in essence, an assay that, that is believable and trusted for screening so that it, it finds all the easy cases, takes out the 80% and reliably does that, leaving the 20% for the radiologist to make a, a, a an intelligent informed concision, but decision, but based, you know, with the knowledge of what the algorithm said, that really reduces the cost of screening and makes it more uh, accessible and, and cost effective. So I think that kind of tool will be very helpful. So that that was one of the, the, the things I was thinking. So do you think there as a kind of excitement for uh, visible AI grows, chat GPT and things like that, that there will be pressure uh, from, you know, administrations and things like that to to force AI onto the scene when, when as uh, various speakers have pointed out, that, that get making making models that are really ready for uh, for prime time is is much more difficult than making a, a research scale demonstration. Do you, do people see that as a potential problem? Well, does anybody remember uh, Watson? Yep. Uh, IBM's big uh, model that was going to be board certified as a radiologist and uh, cure cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it, that was a very good model built by really, really good people, um, but it really couldn't do all the things that it was trying to do yet, although that work is, I think, really, really important. ChatGPT, remember, is it's a chatbot. Its job is to pass a Turing test to convince you that it's a human being. It lies just like a human being. So to me, it's not, you know, it's 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 fun, but I wouldn't want to use it for anything except perhaps uh, as a code generating tool because it does actually write pretty decent Python. Yeah, I want to mention a challenge to about using deep learning and machine learning methods in biomedical area generally. So um, in our work, we have uh, a, a strong feeling that the data is not sufficient for using pure machine learning or deep learning approaches for modeling the drug response prediction. Um, even though some da large data set can um, provide hundreds of thousands of experiment samples for modeling, but comparing to the very complex uh, like tumor molecular system, and also the number of um, available drug-like compounds like at a scale of millions, these like hundreds of thousands of samples are still very small. And so when you try to build a machine learning model, you face severe curse of dimensionality. And but, but although it is a challenging, but it is also it also gives some kind of opportunity. So in this kind of case, people try to use uh, say using uh, incorporate a prior knowledge into a model so that the search space of the optimization process can be smaller and then you can build a model more relevant to the um, mechanical understanding about uh, cancer and cancer treatment. Um, but still, I think uh, in this direction, um, more research efforts are needed. Mm -hmm. I'll just, just say to the, uh, to the audience, if you have uh, questions, please, uh, pre please raise your, your hand and, and we will uh, connect you in to ask a question. So what are the, um, I guess it, it's come up and again, um, particularly with respect to, to medical data, the, the challenges of, of dealing with uh, 
getting obtaining data sets and 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 using or collaborating using de-identified data or sharing data and these these sorts of problems. So how close is the cancer AI community to to overcoming some of these problems? The synthetic data is clearly is is clearly one day to, way to do that, but you need you need data to generate your synthetic your synthetic data in the first place, don't don't you? And that needs to come from from real patients. Well, since I run a data repository, I guess I'll chime in again that um, I think the NIH's recent requirement for data publication, data sharing is really important. And global data sharing, I think, is, is the answer to get large enough samples that represent the actual human population around the planet. So uh, I'm, I'm pleased that we have a large number of repositories in the US. The Europeans are building repositories. There are repositories now in, in India, and a new one just came online in China. So, you know. I think this is a really good trend to grow very large data repositories, both, you know, I focus on imaging, but they're also uh, equivalent genomics repositories to be able to have the, almost the scale of data that Google has on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's a bit tricky though, right? Because certain kinds of data, you know, um, radiological data and, and genomics and this sort of thing, there's there are clear standards and formats and this sort of thing. And so sharing it and, and, and putting it into these large repositories is, you know, I don't want to say easy, right? But it's it's relatively straightforward. Um, but a lot of research data, especially the, the stuff that's happening at sort of the cell level or sort of the cutting edge biological research data, um, while it's shared, it's shared in a huge variety of formats and annotated, you know, sort of differently and, and processed differently and, you know, all the things that happen in research data. And so um, also having those methods that kind of um, accommodate the, you know, let's call it diversity of the data sources um, are going to be important on top of the data sharing policies and that sort of thing as well, I think. Yeah, I, I'm not as... Uh... Convince it shredders as easy as he says to create these large repositories. I mean, obviously he's done it very successfully, but I think uh, to scale it to the, the level that we need with uh, orders of magnitude larger data sets. And especially often what we tend to see is the data shared, uh, either whether it's clinical trial or other things tend to be different than sort of regular clinical data. And I think trying to get more um, standard of care data might also be useful. So we, a lot of longitudinal data is often not, we, we don't, we tend to get snapshots. We don't get as much in the, by way of sort of the entire course of the disease. And there's a lot more, right? Activities, they're sort of, they're not, not just the time they went to the doctor, but what they did between visits, all of that, those data would be great to have. I think we're still ways from sort of integrating all of that. So. So with that, thank, thanks very much to, to all of the speakers again. Uh, it, it's been a, a wonderful, depending on your time zone, morning, <laughs> evening, afternoon um, uh, of talks. Uh, it, it, it's been very enlightening and I've, 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 I've learned a great deal. So um, just to go through again, thank you specifically. Thanks, uh, Dr. Jennifer Couch, Professor Fred Pryor, uh, Professor Jaya, Jaya Sri Kalpathy Kramer and Dr. Yutan Zhu. And uh, I'll, I'll pass you to, to Sean Smith to say goodbye. Uh, thanks very much to uh, May Yun and all of the Intersect staff who've, who've run this session today. So I'll pass, I'll pass you to Sean and he can finish off. Oh, thanks, David. Um... All I can really do is just echo David's thanks. It's been a, an amazing session and you've all been so very generous to, to give your time and your considerable expertise. We appreciate it hugely. So thank, thank you, Fred, Jayashri, uh, Ethan and, and Jennifer. Uh, and thanks also to uh, uh, Mayun and the staff at Intersect who've um, been very carefully managing the recording and so forth. And David, for your, for your moderation. It's been, been, been great. Okay. So with that, we'll see you later and uh, keep
catch you another time, I guess. Bye-bye.